out another big thank you for Dan Hennig and Frank. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome to Julie Mackey's Memorial Celebration of Life. I want to thank each of you for making the special effort of being here this evening. I had wanted to do this without notes. And I tried over and over, and I couldn't do it. So bear with me, and hopefully I'll get through this. I especially want to thank the Art Center, and the San Lorenzo Valley Women's Club for their contributions to this evening. Isn't this great? <laughs> Linda Levy and Sheila Delaney are two individuals that really spearheaded the Art Center and the Valley Women's Club to bring us all here this evening. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you, Linda. We're joined here this evening because Julie Mackey died of lymphoma on July 22nd at 2.14 in the morning. Julie always did like to stay up late. <laughs> we chose today to honor Julie because it is also her birthday. And it serves as a poignant reminder of her life. Julie would have been 69 years young today. today. Happy birthday, Julie. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Happy, Happy birthday. birthday. Mo most of you know Julie as an artist, a kind and gentle soul, full of life and whimsy. But most of you may not know Julie the fighter, the gladiator, the warrior woman. I want to share that other Julie with you this evening as she fought for her life that she loved so much. The best way to do that is to answer the question that everyone asks, what happened? It's been the 800-pound gorilla in the room. From diagnosis to death, Julie lived 16 months. During that time, she had six different chemotherapy regimes. Each regime had multiple treatments. Each treatment took a week of hospitalization. Then two weeks off, back to the hospital, and do it all over again. Each new regime was required because Julie's cancer kept relapsing. With each new relapse, her odds for survival went down, while her risk for going forward grew greater. And yet, each time, Julie decided to fight the fight. She did so because she had so much to live for. She had her two boys, their three boys, each of you, and me. Julie's decision to keep fighting were not easy to make. <clears throat> for the entire 16 months, she lived with constant abdominal pain, extreme fatigue, nausea, no taste, no appetite. She could no longer eat foods she loved. She forced herself to drink and sure, which she despised. <laughs> she had to consume three liters of water a day, all the while being nauseated. She had a central line, which each day before showers had to be covered with saran wrap and taped, which she hated. She needed blood transfusions, IV medications, fluids several times a week, and that was what, when she wasn't in the hospital. 
With each chemo treatment, Julie got weaker and sicker. And yet, she decided to keep fighting. Julie was also staged and had stem cells collected for a bone marrow transplant. It was her only chance of survival. The night before going to the hospital for a minimum of four to eight weeks, the transplant was canceled. She had too much tumor burden to go forward. A turning point decision was at hand. Continue treatment in hopes of getting a transplant or stop and die in two to three months. Again, Julie chose to fight for herself, her family, and for each of you. In April of this year, after several more chemo regimes, Stanford gave up on Julie and told her to go into hospice or find a trial therapy. So in May, Julie got a second opinion at UCSF Medical Center, where a high-risk, high-dose chemotherapy was proposed. At the same time, she arranged to go to MD Anderson in Texas to be evaluated for an experimental drug therapy. This time, the choices were even more excruciating and stark. Doing nothing and die, do a trial for which you are given zero odds because there is no data, or attempt an extremely dangerous and difficult chemo treatment requiring a minimum 30-day hospitalization, a 15% chance of success, and a 30% chance of death from the treatment. Once again, Julie decided to fight on. She chose the high-risk chemo at UCSF, knowing it was going to make her sicker than ever before, and she may die from it. But she chose it because it gave her the best chance to live. It was her only remaining hopes for getting a transplant. So on June 11th to July 7th, Julie underwent high-risk chemo. She suffered mightily, and not only survived, but the prognosis was good for getting her to transplant quickly. We didn't know it, but unfortunately, that wasn't to be. During Julie's follow-up discharge visit, she agreed to implement plans to continue her fight. <coughs> These were needed in the event that her tumor burden had not shrunk enough to qualify her for a transplant at UCSF. Thus, Julie was scheduled to go to Seattle for an experimental tandem transplant evaluation, and also to be evaluated for a phase one experimental drug program at UCSF. Throughout all of this, Julie had once again girded herself to continue her fight for life. But out of nowhere, on Thursday, July 12th, my birthday, Julie developed a large lump on her chest within four hours. By 5 a.m. on Friday, she was in the emergency room at UCSF. By Saturday at 2.30 in the afternoon, I was told Julie was terminal, and would only live two to three days. There were no more options. The rapid and massive tumor growth so soon after such high-dose chemo meant no trial or treatment center would take her. Turns out, Julie had a strain of chemo-resistant cancer cells that actually thrive on chemo. The more you give it, the faster it grows, and that is exactly what happened. To the extent that a week later, our little Julie, when she died, she looked as though she was pregnant with twins. 
When I told Julie that Saturday, when I held Julie that Saturday to tell her the end was near, she was already fading in and out of consciousness. It took us over an hour, but she spoke of her fight and her desire to continue fighting, but in a different way. She said she was tired, but relieved to have nothing more she could do to fight for her life any longer. She also hoped her last days would be free of pain she had struggled against for so long. But tragically, that wish was not to be. For the entire seven days that Julie was in palliative care at UCSF, she increasingly suffered and died in agony until her very last and final moments. But because of all the pain and suffering she had endured, she wanted to continue her fight for others. Julie's, <clears throat> Julie was an organ donor ever since the little pink dots for driver's licenses in California became available. But she wanted to do even more. Julie wanted her remains to go to medical research and education. She said, and I quote, she hoped in some small way she could help someone else not have to suffer as much as she had. Regrettably, the organ, the organ donor registry, due to the extent of her lymphoma, rejected Julie. But after much difficulty, on July 25th, Julie's sons and I succeeded in donating her remains to the UCSF Willed Body Program for Medical Research and Education. At the conclusion of their investigations, Julie's remains will be cremated and spread at sea beneath the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. So tonight you have learned of Julie, you have learned of a Julie Mackey you may not have known. All five foot four 103 pounds of unrelenting kryptonite <laughs> steeled throughout for her zest and zeal and fight for life. The fighter, the, the gladiator, the woman warrior, Julie Mackey. Before you begin your stories about the life and times of the other Julie we all know so well, there's a very special person that I want to thank from Julie's heart and mine, Dr. David Resnick Sanis. For the entire 16 months, there was hardly a day that went by that I did not speak to Dr. Dave about Julie's care. Whether it was big picture or small, David was always there to provide feedback about the hot shots, about what the hot shots were, or more importantly, were not doing. All the while, David's sole focus was what was best for Julie, and especially how to keep her as safe and comfortable as possible throughout her ordeal. There are no sufficient words to thank you, David, but perhaps Julie says it best, you are a gem.
And now for the fun part. <laughs> the circle of memories. This is the evening's main event because it is Julie's favorite part. Whenever she went to someone's memorial, she loved to tell and hear the stories. So now each of you can share your stories or comments about what it's like to share your life and times with Julie. Take your time, remember to breathe, but most of all, please make us laugh or cry. It's up to you. If anyone doesn't want to be on Santa Cruz Community Television, just say you don't want to be, you don't want to be recorded and the camera will be turned off. What is most important is that you feel comfortable to speak your mind and to share your memories with all of us. This should not be hard, given Julie's way of saying whatever was on her mind to anyone at any time. <laughs> I'm sure we are in for some real zingers. So here's one of Julie's hand-built mugs for you to hold and have with you as you speak. When you are done, please pass it to the next speaker. We also have been asked to use this cordless microphone. It does not amplify, it just helps the camera record your comments. Who would like to go first? <laughs> pretty tired because I've been working all day. Um, the reality is uh, I've learned more about Julie probably in the last six or seven months than I knew before because in my business, which is pharmacy, as most of you probably know or some of you do, uh, people will ask me, hey, do you know so-and-so? They live in Boulder Creek. And I say, well, if they're not sick, I probably don't know them. <laughs> well, that was kind of the case with Julie because, you know, she had a couple prescriptions from now and then, and same for Joe. Um, so I'd only see him on rare occasions. And, and although over the last uh, six months or so, I got to know Joe pretty good. And uh, we have a way of describing certain patients, customers, that require a little more, a um, little more time, you know, uh, so they can be contribute, uh, referred to as nuisance uh, <laughs> customers. You know, I, I, I'm not going to put go there with Joe. I will say this: is a lot of you that know Joe. Um, when he calls, either uh, in person or by telephone. You better have your thinking cap on and tune, <laughs> and tune out everything else because this guy is one sharp individual. And, and I will say from my observations and dealings with him that after a short time, I was so impressed with his knowledge about uh, Julie's condition. I think at some point he probably knew more than a lot of the doctors did about her pharmaceutical care, about different aspects and if anybody if he could have moved heaven and earth he would have done it Amen. you know Amen. And he showed that every time I saw him and Joe I don't know how you get it man because I need my six six and a half hours of sleep and I know you didn't do that and I know that th Thursday that you had to drive to UCSF and get you got there I think at 5 a.m. or roughly you know and I know because I talked to you that afternoon and you, you went through both you and Julie went through a lot of highs and lows I mean, there were times when you were out would be a little bit optimistic and then all of a sudden it'd be a, a rough patch and somehow with you and between the two of you which just watching this video um, came to realize, boy, you scored, I'll tell you that. <laughs> I had no idea, and I think a lot of it, but uh, a lot of that And uh, so, so anyway, um, 
I don't want to take up everybody's time here. You know, I can ramble on and on, as you can. I mean, staff will tell you. Uh, but um, I, I do want to. Uh, I want to say first of all that Joe never entered the nuisance stage of, uh, of the customer, <laughs> and, and in such a pet way that we sometimes add on a, what we call a nuisance fee. <laughs> However, uh, this is a small group. So get it up, all right. But um, no, actually, I, I enjoyed our encounters. I, uh, I thrive on just gaining more knowledge and doing what help I can, even though when I know my hands are tied in a lot of aspects and, and resources limited, and, and there wasn't a heck of a lot. But, uh, but I'll tell you what, if anybody had a chance, you know, this is the guy you want fighting behind you. <laughs> and obviously, from what I saw and from what I heard, uh, Julie was uh, the type of gladiator you described, and not, not only that, I never realized the talent she has. Um, I can't draw a stick figure, but I do appreciate talent in others. My children, uh, my children's friends, some are very artistic. My wife, her, let's see, left half of the brain is more dominant than right, which is my situation. <laughs> but anyway, I, I, I just want to say, uh, Joe, uh, you inspired me a great deal, and Julie's memories are obviously going to live on in a very positive way for all of us. Is, is, this, my, is, this, is this my mug, or do I have to give it away? Okay, well, I better, there's a lot of people okay. here I'm sure want to speak. Okay, there you go. Someone lost an iPhone in the bathroom. Oh, why? It's a lost and found she, over she there. She found it. She found it. This hat I'm wearing is from uh, sort of an uh, erotic ball that there were a lot of them in the early 80s. And um, Sheila and I went to a couple of them. <laughs> But one of the funniest stories I ever heard was when Joe and Julie went to one in San Francisco. And I, I, I wasn't there. I can only, it's all in my imagination, which is perhaps better yet. <laughs> they pushed a brass bed. It was the hooker's ball. The hooker's ball. They pushed it into the middle of the auditorium, as I remember it. And I'm not sure what happened next, but it, it was, in my, my imagination, one of the funniest things ever. There were two and, hookers and me. And, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, no. <laughs> so I, 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 um, it's a fond memory of a place that I wasn't, but heard about. Yeah. <laughs> OK, who's going to take over? <laughs> Oh, this is this is this is the T-shirt from when Joe was was running for supervisor. That was, in, um, but that's sort of a Julie story. Oh, Sheila and Julie designed the back of it, I think. The, you know, um, so um, yeah, we did a lot of crazy stuff, and uh, including T-shirts and uh, driving around in my 1936 International truck with loudspeakers and a piano. Somebody on a piano on the back side, um, playing away and haranguing the uh, populace. Uh, we went, I know we, that we went through Santa Cruz at times. Not sure why. I guess the 5th District went into Santa Cruz or something. <laughs> so, anyway, I, I want to I hand this on. <laughs> and, and you don't need to stand up. It's on? Oh, that's nice. Bonnie, you were going to say something? Did you want to say something? You don't have to stand up. You can just sit down if you want. Uh, no, I'd rather stand. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know if anybody in this room has known Julie as long as I have. Um, How long have you known Julie? <laughs> we started out in the Arts Center in L.A. And... Um, my husband and her husband were friends, and so, of course, Julie and I met, and it was instant. Julie just gathered me into her fantasy. You know, she just drew you. And uh, we, we remained friends. I will say that the wealth in my life is my friends and those who have stayed in support of me, and Julie was right on the top of that list. 
boy, am I going to miss her, but I swear she is going to be talking to me. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> she speaks to me in my work because my work is inspired by her enthusiasm and her encouragement. I've written a program for educating people with the visual arts, and everybody here in this community, as a matter of fact, is part of that. And um, I just want to say that when we were in New York after going to school, we all went to New York, you know, big deal, and um, uh, with the big agencies, you know, our husbands were in the big agencies, and we had to show our, uh, our artistic uh, power. And so therefore, when we went to parties, which there were a lot of them, um, of course, you know, we'd dress up and sh Julie stole the show. She would walk in. Well, you know. <laughs> and she, she, just cut, uh, she just cut a great figure. And I was amazed how such a beautiful and stunning personality could befriend me, the common Bonnie. You know, I was from the Midwest, <laughs> Minnesota. And, you know, we had a great friendship. All through the years, we kept in touch. They went to England, we went to Australia. It's, it was been an exciting life. But I will say this. Her sons are my sons. Don't you ever forget that. <laughs> I am here for you. And she was a gladiator. I'm a Viking. We're fighters. <laughs> and that's what I admired about her. This cute little thing, this beautiful little thing with the power and strength. And I have to say to Joe, the last time I see Julie, saw Julie, I realized that I didn't have the courage to sit by her side. And I'm very grateful you were there every inch of the way. and her courage, her willingness to fight on, and that's what I remember, and that's what you focused, and that's who she was. Now, um, I had ideas of wearing something also. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. And so I wore something. This <laughs> is an old t-shirt. <laughs> this is an old t-shirt. It's not about Joe Kuchera, but it is about standing out from the herd. <laughs> And you know what? Most of the people I know here in this room have done that. Distinguished themselves in community. You know, the time is such that we as elders now must stand up. We must. That's the message. She stood for things. She stood, she stood because she was strong because she knew her heart. And I hope that we all follow our hearts and get involved and be part of our communities and help them grow. Help the person who needs a casserole next door. Help those who are fighting uh, to keep our communities and our values together. That's what Julie would say. She would just continue. And I believe that her work continues in my work. And I think that's the way it is with all of us. I'm proud to have had her as a friend. I couldn't have been more blessed. The many faces of Julie, who's next? Her godson? <laughs> You're up. I'm on camera. Bonnie. Right there, Bonnie. Please. Okay. Another great friend. I uh I don't want to wait and wait because I'm just I don't know what I'm gonna say really. I didn't have anything prepared because it goes back so far with Julie that uh, we, when we, I graduated from San Windsor Valley High School here in town and then I was gone for a while, school and travel and such and such. And when I came back, one of the first people I connected with was Julie Mackey. And um, of course we were setting up a pottery and she was an artist and we, just had parallel lives in so many ways. Our kids started out at Redwood Open School all the way up there on Big Basin Way and then we graduated on to 
you know, Boulder Creek community events and arts and, I mean, through it all though, the main thing was just our excitement about clay. I mean, we just, Julie had this great sense of humor and it totally came out in everything she made. And luckily I have a couple of pieces that I treasure. And um, for Dan and I, um, just, Julie was just such a ma major part of, of the community, the political thing, the arts. When, um, I just remember when we got here at the Art Center and we opened our doors and Julie was just beaming and it's just like, whoa. Nobody thought we were going to do this. Look, <laughs> look what happened. Oh my gosh. So, you know, in the early days, there weren't a lot of people. I mean, it's grown and grown and grown. But, um, you know, we had no committee, so we volunteered to do shows. And so every year I'd do a show, and I'd always call Julie, and she'd be, yeah, yeah, let's, let's make it happen. Her enthusiasm was always right there. She'd come down here, we'd be up here putting stuff all around the art center and making these shows happen, and her enthusiasm was just always positive. And she was a gladiator, and in the way she lived her life and in her full embrace of everything that there was a possibility and opportunity of doing. So anyway, I'm just rambling on too, but um, her her enthusiasm for clay, I think, lives on through the Art Center and the strong clay program we have here. She was part of, you know, making sure that that went forward, and um, I'll always remember her for that. So, oh, that was easy. My name is Roberta McPherson, and I met Julie because our kids went to the same school. Uh, it started out as University of the Trees School and then became Evergreen School. It was uh, a great place that the kids had uh, opportunity to learn from a lot of people, and one of those people was Julie. And uh, it's fitting that I'm holding a mug because she helped my daughter make a mug. And we still have that mug today, and it's one of our special treasured things because uh, art is just a foreign language to me and she spoke it so well and she shared it with my daughter and my daughter did beautiful art and I just was always so amazed and Julie was so patient and enthusiastic with all of the kids getting them involved in their artwork uh, that um, it wasn't until later that I really got to know Joe but from the very beginning uh, of the time at school, Julie just was a wonderful gift to all those kids, including my daughter and including me. Thank you. We have a mug like this at home, and I'm afraid if I hold it, I'll break it. So will you hold it <laughs> so I don't have to think about it while I'm talking? Thank you. Um, I don't know. I guess I've known Julie since 76. It's hard to remember. It's like you've known. I remember watching her drive down a hill. I'd known her for a couple of years in a red sweater. We were like meeting to do something with the kids probably. And I was struck how beautiful she was. Um, just that I never said anything to her and um, in the hospital I guess we were the last people she really talked to before she died um, and she looked just so beautiful um, and the quality was just like okay I ran into Julie and we're at the art center and everybody's talking and we go out on the bench and just talk a while and catch up um, and that would often happen and um, how much she loved Joe and that we would be there for him how proud we always did the family first how proud she was of her boys and that they were really really good fathers 
and sh and it just made her feel so good inside knowing that and um she loved her grandchildren but really loved them because of their fathers i think and that you two were friends and how much that meant to her um And then she talked about my stepson Aaron and Damien and he were inseparable and my daughter Mariah who Damien helped raise who became a ceramicist I think because of her time with Julie and all the wonderful ceramics in our house. Um, I think she instilled that love in her and then we talked about what happens when you die and what she believed and what I believed and we pretty much believed the same thing so that was not a long conversation. <laughs> Seriously. Um, and a book she'd read that reminded her something of me and she wanted to get the book to me and a friend had give it to her but she couldn't remember the title. So you know we went through the alphabet that didn't help both being older and um, conversation could have happened at any time and it struck me how much I enjoyed her um, every every time I was with her I enjoyed her <laughs> for my husband's 60th birthday she and Joe made him this hat out of paper that was about this high. An entire coat to wear out of folded paper where he looked like some kind of African king. I mean, you know. <laughs> this is somebody who... Um, so there was the artist in her and the way she lived her life was as an artist. She knew what was important and that's what made me cry in those pictures because that smile on Julie's face and everyone is, hmm, that's interesting. What do you think of that? There was this kind of peace it gave her inside that I really, really enjoyed about her. <sighs> and I'm just wish she was here and it makes me wonder like I want to do this when I'm still here but it doesn't happen that way I guess um, just the shirt the Joe Kuchera shirt I could go on and on but it's it's just wonderful and thank you for letting me speak so long <laughs> Um, my name's Kathy, and I met Julie and Joe when I was probably 19 years old and a student at UCSC. I, was, I don't want to go on because there's so much about her that I remember and can think of. And of course, the first story I thought of, I thought, oh no, you shouldn't tell that story. And then I thought, <laughs> and then I thought Julie would want me to tell it. I don't even know if she knows it. But I was dating a guy who I met my second year at UC Santa Cruz, I think, and he was kind of crazy and wild, and he was Joe's campaign manager. His name was Randy. I don't know if any of you remember him. But he would spend, <laughs> you know, instead of studying or doing all the things he was supposed to do, he was always up in this valley, you know, campaigning, putting up lawn signs, handing out bumper stickers, doing all of that. And one night, he comes home, and he's got this pink box, and there is a black negligee in it. And, you know, I'm a UCSC student. We don't wear black negligees. <laughs> and I said, where did this come from? And he says, well, you know, I was working with Joe all day, and at the end of the day, he said we had to stop at this store because he had to buy something for Julie. <laughs> and he apparently goes there all the time and buys her <laughs> something, and it works for him. So I thought <laughs> I would bring this to you. <laughs> and I just, I thought that was so sweet. And I will always remember 
it and I always save that negligee. No other man has ever bought me a piece of lingerie. <laughs> so you, you and Julie inspired it. <laughs> so and just a, on a little bit more a thoughtful note, you know, I was thinking about Julie and you know all the things that people have touched on that are so special about her and. You know, the things that stood out the most for me was, you know, I think someone in one of the little articles or what I read, that I read called her quirky. And I thought, well, what does that really mean? And I thought, well, in Julie it meant she could look at a person, a child, a piece of art, or with me, like a piece of campaign literature. And she could always find what was really interesting and unique about it. And that was such a special thing. It was always fun to run things by her because she'd have such a, an amazing take on it. And that was such a great quality. And the other thing I thought of was how you know, kind she was. And I saw it up here with all of you, how kind she was. I saw when I had my kids, I had two boys. And we really connected, I think, over that with her having two boys. But uh, you know, the night w the second one came home, she and Joe came over and cooked us dinner, and it wasn't like a casserole left on your door. It was like they came in, they cooked fettuccine, we had dessert. It was like going to a restaurant in your own home. It was so thoughtful. Um, and she gave me these, um, when each child was born, a little candle hoard holder, which was on every birthday cake till they were 18 years old, which I brought with me. They're so special. She was just a a really thoughtful person. And then the final quality that was really strong about Julie and that I'll always remember and treasure was her intense loyalty. She was so loyal to you, Joe. You know, I've never seen anybody talk about a fighter when you were in office and people were after you. She was just a rock. And, and for me, too, when I worked for you later, and you know, sometimes things weren't always easy. It was, right. She was really um, intensely loyal and always to the boys and to the valley. She loved all of you so much. And so anyway, and I, I guess I should wrap up, but I just think the last thing I would say when I think of those qualities of that kind of quirkiness and generosity and loyalty, it's really you know, what I see in this room too. I mean, you are a reflection of her and she's a reflection of you and it's really special. So thank you. Uh, I'm Nancy Macy, live in Boulder Creek. Used to campaign for Joe Couture for supervisor. Uh, <laughs> so you're biased? <laughs> A little. My favorite campaign meetings were the very few that we had at Joe's house because it was such a great place to go to. Um, nestled in beautiful, verdant area and filled with art and joy. And we had two of those incredible little candle holders. And they're in an exhibit back there, right there. We had the goat and the fish, because Andrew wasn't born yet. And by the time he was born, somehow I missed the third. Regret that terribly, because in the earthquake of 89, they were in a place of honor on shelves above the kitchen sink. So they became myriad pieces of clay, back to their former nature, totally broken in little pieces. And so that, that, that was the worst part about the earthquake. It wasn't the destroyed fireplace or you know the other problems. It was losing Julie's beautiful art. And um, one of our favorite times was with Joe and Julie and Lyndon Chan Moore. And Ken and I got to go down to Saratoga to Julie's show there. How many years ago was that? Oh my God, that was well, maybe not quite that long, but anyway, it was a great show. And that was when I really got to know her big art. <laughs> she, she was so much a part of her art. <coughs> It could be incredibly profound and, and serious when you looked at like one face or one facet of this huge woman, always colorful. 
And then the other side was so damn funny, really sexy. <laughs> and it was, she was just all those things. So I'm, I, I know we're having fun thinking about her and remembering her. But you know what else she did? She used to be a part of the phone tree for the Valley Women's Club. This was before emails, and when we needed to call people and get a message out, she was one of the people that called eight other people, who called eight other people to get the word out. And she walked proudly down the middle of Highway 9 for the Highway 9 safety campaign. We shut down Highway 9. We walked from Boulder Creek, uh, Ben Lomond Market, to Highlands Park to tell people, God damn it, slow down. This is our neighborhood street. You don't get to go so fast. And so she was a part of those things too. She's really a part of our lives and a part of the valley. Gonna miss her. Next. Hi, my name's Rebecca. And um, we bought a house on Clear Creek in 92. And we hadn't even moved there. We had a horticulturist go to look at the trees. And uh, this neighbor up the street, Lorraine Ross, saw his car there and was like, who's moving there? Who's moving there? Tell me about them. What's, what are they like? And he gave, him the, he gave her the scoop. And she was really excited because we had all kids the same ages. And I was living, we were living in Saratoga at the time. And we get this message on our machine. And we're so excited you're moving to Clear Creek. And you can come this weekend or next weekend or whenever you want for dinner. And I was like, wow, this is intense. This is pretty amazing. So of course, we said yes and we went and there were the Rosses and there was Joe and Julie. We hadn't even moved in yet and Joe and Julie were there to greet us and welcome us. Amazing, totally amazing and that's how we got to meet Julie and got to meet Joe and um, got to know over time Joe's incredible martinis which I still want to savor in <laughs> and uh, that's something I always think of Julie is I almost came with a martini glass because she loved Joe's martinis which were all different wonderful um, and uh, I'll never forget her coming to a large fourth of July party and offering to do painting for uh, faces yeah. and came with all the supplies but little did she know that all, like almost every kid and adult and I mean they were so amazing she I think she painted faces for five hours you know and she was totally involved with each individual and really sensitive to who they were and laughing and having amazing conversations and I'd really never seen anything like it it was amazing and um, a really special thing for me was when um, she did the show at her gallery. We had a gallery in Saratoga. And um, her art was all around the space. Joe worked real hard to set it all up. And to be in the field of jo uh, Julie Mackey's work for two months was amazing. Because every day there'd be new aspects, new elements, new things that I would see and appreciate. And appreciate her sense of humor. You know, she's such a um, warm and lovely and beautiful person with such an amazing sense of humor. And um, so I just still appreciate that experience very, very much and have a lot of love for her. Thank you. Who's next? Hi, I'm Valerie, and I'm the tenant at Joe and Julie's house. Um, I moved in there, oh, it's been about 15, 16 years now. Once I, once I got in there, yeah, it's, they've had a hard time getting in. It's a fabulous place at Joe's and Julie's house. It's a beautiful piece of property, and it's such a nice lifestyle to live this way in a gorgeous house. The architecture inside is absolutely beautiful. Every way you look, I never ever get tired of it or take it for granted. And, uh, and all around the house is a beautiful garden. Beautiful garden and truly love to work in the garden. And um, one of my favorite memories um, of Julie is, is coming home and um, sorry, <laughs> um, and I'd pull up after working all day 
and she, um, I'd hear this voice going, oh, Valerie, I can't do it right. <laughs> oh, Valerie, and somewhere in the garden, behind a tree, under a bush, up on a ladder, somewhere would be Julie. And, um, and she'd welcome me home, and I'd go over and have a little chat with her about what was going on. And she'd be clipping away and brushing things up and making things the whole time. While I'd just be sitting there enjoying the beautiful scene and, and um, uh, the ambience of the place. Um, I'm really, I can think of a couple things that I'm, I'm always and forever grateful to Julie for. Uh, she, one, the first thing is, um, I've been there about a year, it was my birthday, and, and um, she gave me one of the best birthday presents I ever got. She gave me a, a rake, and she put a little, she drew a little heart on it, and she drew my name on it. And um, it's, it's one of these fans, I'd never had a, a rake of my very own before. <laughs> And uh, it's a really nice rake. It has a little clip. You can clip it up, and it comes up nice and compact, and you can put it away, or you can take it out. And it's, it's a wonderful gadget. And um, I've always used it all these years. It's still almost like new. It works really great. So I'm, I'm forever grateful for that. It's one of my prized possessions. Um, the, other, the other thing is one day I, I came home um, to the house, and um, on, the, on, the, on my door was pasted a little uh, article from a newspaper. It was just taped on there. So I looked at it and um, Julie had put it there. It was, it was an article about a hula festival up in, in Pleasanton. And um, she had heard that I had lived in Hawaii when I was, was young. And so she thought maybe I'd be interested in the hula festival. So um, I thought, well, I didn't know anything about this or what it might be. But I thought, OK, I'll go, go check out the hula festival. And it's a fabulous thing. It happens every year in Pleasanton, the first week in November, just one dance after another after another gorgeous flowers, live musicians, incredible. And um, so after that, I was like, well, maybe I could start taking a hula. That looks like fun. And another person at work that I knew was kind of thinking along the same line. So we sort of talked to each other into it. So it's been 10 years now, and I've been dancing all, ever since then. So <laughs> she's really, really changed my life that way. Um, I'm, I really miss Julie. It's really hard going to the house and looking all around that, the garden. Um, and, but it's also very um, joyous because it's beautiful. I feel very connected with her out there. And um, she's spent a lot of time out there, many, many years. And there's all these little plants in little corners at different times of year that pop up that you, you didn't even notice before or suddenly you notice. And so I'm kind of thinking, well, you know, Julie might be gone, but somewhere in the sediment of this little spot of nature, there will be a little layer of Julie that will always, always be there. You can always tune it to. <laughs> so, that's my thoughts. <laughs> I'm not Lori right now. I'm I'm Judy Dykstra Brown, and 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 Judy Dykstra Brown is here like in spirit, and she said, please stand up and say for me that she uh, such a memory that she has of, of course all her white elephant uh, uh, parties that she'd have, but she said when uh, she reminded me and wanted to reiterate that she was so grateful for Julie and Joe's compassion for her during her ordeal that she went through with her own husband losing him, Bob Brown. And she said, Joe and Julie were so supportive for me. And they came up and they brought food, just like some other people were saying. And they just really were there with her through that. And she so appreciates it. So that's from Judy Dykstra Brown. I can talk to the microphone, but I can't talk straight to you. Um, this is difficult. Valerie gave me a segue, because I was able to live next door to Joe and Julie for four or five wonderful years. It is the place that is, no words, just a wonderful place to be. You just feel it. You see it, and you feel it. My first recollection of Joe and Julie was at the Spring Fair in Santa Cruz in the 70s, Earth Day, 
Paula was there. Um, Joe and Julie were selling Julie's pottery. And I believe I fell in love with Julie's pottery at that point. And um, Mary brought to mind a piece that I bought. Do I have to? I'm going to tell you, it was called Kiss My Ass, Sit on My Face. <laughs> It was, it was two sculptured man and woman, one with the strawberry head and one with the pineapple head. Very exquisite pieces. Um, I've continued to care, hold what? <laughs> this is in front of your grandkids, Julie. <laughs> um, that, I, just wonderful, wonderful memories of a wonderful woman. And, and Joe, my hat's off to you. Thank you. Thank you for all you <laughs> Somebody else gets to do this now. Oh, good, Sheila. <laughs> And we, after we moved, we moved here from San Jose, like a lot of people did, and started a store in Boulder Creek. And I can remember walking past Bear Creek Mercantile and seeing these wonderful, crazy pottery pieces in the window and thinking, this is one brave person. Who makes these? Um, and I think the first piece I bought was one that was a little bird that Julie had made and that Gail had embroidered a small satin bag for it to go into. And I still have it. And what I could afford was uh, those birthday candle holders that are on the cake back there. And many years later, I was at Julie's house and I saw this bisqueware owl up on a shelf. And I said, what's that? And she said, oh, I never finished that. I said, I like that. I'll buy it. She said, OK. I said, whenever you finish it, I'll buy it. <laughs> Joe has told me today that that took many hours to paint. So it is a treasure, years. But I cherish that piece. Um, I think that, I mean, we had been involved in politics in San Jose in marijuana decriminalization, if you want to know. Um, but, but when we came here, we got involved in politics that was fun. With Joe and Julie, we stood on street corners with balloons and said, you know, go out and vote, go out and vote. I mean, it was, it was politics that was fun and engaging and interesting and involving. And that's how I think it ought to be. And if it isn't, then it's not how it ought to be. Um, and I honor you for all the work you've done and all the fighting you've done. I mean, I know you fought for those of us in Love Creek, and I know how you fought for Julie. And I think I better stop now because I'm going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> Following up on what Nancy Macy said, um, as emergency preparedness director at that point, I would get phone calls saying, um, a good example, the water district is once, it, we have a tremendous freeze and we have to have everybody drip their water faucets so the pipes will remain open. So I called Julie, because I didn't know who else to call, and she was doing it all. And she had to call all the neighborhood coordinators to alert them that they had to drip their faucets. Well, I'll be damned, but the next day, the water district called again. You can't have them drip their faucets. We're running out of water. So, <laughs> <laughs> so she went back and did the same thing all over again. And we made it through that. The other thing I want to say is I just find Joe Kachara has been really, uh, really gone way above and beyond in having this. Look at all of us who have gotten together, who haven't seen each other in many a year. We don't even recognize each other in some cases. <laughs> but it's wonderful, Joe, and I know it was hard as hell to do this, but it certainly is appreciated by all of us. Thank you. <laughs> Could you pass that over to her, please? Okay. 
I don't want to do this. So, I'm a friend of Julie's. <laughs> Sorry, I, yeah. Um, my mom and her, I, I'm honored, I'm lucky. Because I've known her all my life. We, or my mother was best friends with her mother. And her father stayed at my mom and dad's house when, when um, he moved out here from Michigan with his wife and her mom, her, her, bear with me, her dad died when um, he was only 26. And so Julie's mom had one little baby that was in her stomach and two children to raise as a single mom. And some of Julie's family uh, that go back that far have been and passed through here tonight. So I grew up with her, sort of. I grew up kind of following her. Um, and, um, and so I've known her all my life. And she's, she's been a given. You know how you have people in your life that are givens. And we never thought twice about whether we loved each other or, or where we were going. We just joined. When we were in New York City, together with Damien and Josh's father, um, we just did things um, because they made us happy. And that was kind of her spirit, you know. She'd be busy doing something and creating a woman in the middle of the apartment that was like paper mache, that was like nine feet tall, <laughs> you know. And then, and then I inherited the apartment. And what would I do with her? Well, I wouldn't part with her. Whatever happened to her after me was important. Um, and she taught me how to sew, and I taught her how to dress, and 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 we just we just were very simpatico in all her life. It was the case, and I don't have anything magical to say because because it all was very simple. What I didn't realize, and which is really important is the depth of her commitment to her art. And to be here and have realized the growth that Julie made, because I would go, every time I would go into the house, there'd be something, you know, again, 10 feet tall. And, and, and I think one of the things, bear with me on this, one of the things that I experienced recently was when we went to a pottery show in, in um, Mason Center, is that what it's called? Fort Mason. And Julie looked at all the work that was there. Um, she realized um, how much Joe had meant to her in terms of being able to help her assemble, put together, construct, figure out how these goddamn things were going to like, <laughs> you know, hold up. I mean, he figured out the temperature of the kiln and, you know what I mean? And then we had like half a body and then we had a head and, oh. and Joe was like there and then he'd mount them on the wall and they're all over the house. So they had this collaboration where she created and then he was able to kind of actually bring it all together. <laughs> and, um, and so she, she missed him at that, at that time and, and just, I think, really realized um, how much she missed him when he had to take care of his family back east. And, uh, and I then started to realize that she had a world that had nothing to do with me, you know, and it's your world in this gallery. And and I, uh, I know the people that were important. Dave, you were, Dr. Dave, you were amazingly important in helping us. Thanks. Who did this? Yeah. Did I just shut up? Okay. <laughs> Well, uh, I already
already had my turn, but Carol, anyway, um, I, I, several years ago, built myself a shed, you know, it's like 10 feet tall in the back and so on to store surfboards for my children and myself. Well, <clears throat> over the last few years, the shed's been converted into a studio little by little. I lost all my storage and my wife now <laughs> has uh, hobbies that kind of reflect Julie's uh, love for creating things, you know, and so forth. So I, I do totally understand what Joe had to go through in, in hanging some of that stuff up and banging your head on it when it wasn't high enough and so on. But um, my wife, you know, her sciatic has flared up. She would have loved to be here and, and see some of this because she's a real art lover and I have become one myself. So that's all I wanted to say. But now I'm getting tired and i got to bail. Where'd you go, Ken? Okay. Thank you all. Um, my name is Ken Arez. I um, have never done this before, and uh, but I did want to say how much I appreciate the generosity of Julie and Joe letting me come into their home as an awkward 13-year-old as I became friends with Joshua. And uh, talk about somebody who can see beyond the artifice, see beyond the pretensions. You know, anytime you talk to Julie, she'd ask you the right question after it. She would, she would hear through what you were saying and actually understand where you're coming from. How do you walk down your, your walkway at, at your house and see past the broken branches and, and see the beautiful, you know, the plants as they should be, as they can be? She could see that. She could see that transcendence through that and always see what was beyond it. And I, I think the gift of the, the artist is to bring people like myself back to what is truly important in all of that. And Julie did that. You know, when she was rolling ravioli dough and when she was, you know, cutting, taking cut flowers and, and arranging them and putting them on the bathroom counter, always seeing beyond those things that, that can drag us all down and really, really seeing what's important. So I, I feel enriched by knowing her. Julie was a a very, very, very dear friend of mine. Not as long as all of you. But every moment was very precious to me. We had a lot in common, our gardening, our love for wine, tea, talking about our sons and our grandchildren. She loved very, very much. And the first time I went to her house and saw the inside and all of that art I thought I was in another world. <laughs> so inspiring and realizing what a creative, creative person she was. She really fought these last couple of years and although she, she didn't make it, um, I really have to commend Joe for every moment that he went through to help her tirelessly all he did for her. She appreciates every moment that you spent, Joe. Please realize that. And I feel like I'm part of the family. I got to know Damien. He kept me informed. And she always told me about Josh and, and the grandkids. And I, I just felt part of the family. And I feel very honored. And I'm going to miss her a lot. And. Um, even though she left us long before we wanted her to. As they say, she went on to get the party started for us. <laughs> Anyone next? Cousin Martha, do you have any thoughts or memories? From you don't even have to stand up. You're not required. Thanksgiving. Yeah. No, I'll just say sometime. I remember. You're more than the mic. Yeah. Back in the 70s, when you were not allowed to have a TV in your house, and you guys put on a play for Thanksgiving. And you remember that? I don't know. Okay, can you t
Martha's not too thrilled about getting up and talking like this, but I would comment that I've known Julie, what, about, uh, Joe and Julie, roughly 30 years from the time we first met. Um, Martha, is, they're cousins by marriage, or by blood, I should say, I'm cousin by marriage. But uh, one of the things that I can tell about Julie is that she would come down and visit. She, we had an open door policy with her where, because she'd come down to visit her mother and her mother was at the motion picture home in Calabasas and we live out in Agoura and not very far from there and one of the things that I was always amazed when she came down is I'm a type A personality so I gotta have things quick, I got them fast and everything else she would come in, she'd spend a week, maybe ten days and take care of her mother and go visit her every day and she'd leave early in the morning many times before I got up for work and I usually left pretty early and she'd come in seven, eight o'clock at night and she spent the whole day over there doing things with her mother. We talked to her about it, and Martha told me some of the things she did. She'd, you know, whether it be combing her hair, taking her to lunch, uh, doing her nails, reading to her. But, you know, it's, it's a special type of person who can do that and just come down and, and focus on that with her mother day after day and just enjoy it. And she, she, it wasn't like it was a burden to her. She just did it. That was her. So that was another <laughs> characteristic of her. Thanks. I think it's time that the next generation have a little something to say. Um, I was one of the kids that grew up with the majority of you people that are out here, and, and, and Joe and Julie, who made this community something to fight for. Um, you know, my mom was gone a lot, you know, and uh, I remember as a child saying to her, you know, why are you going to one more meeting? Stay home. Stay home with me. <laughs> and today, when I left a campaign kickoff and my seven-year-old boy tugged on my shirt and said, Dad, why don't you stay home with me tonight? And I realize how important it is the work that Joe you did and Julie and Nancy and and Sheila and my mom you know you provided a community for us that was safe to grow up in and to, it, it's taken this race for me to realize the sacrifices that you made were for us and the sacrifices that I'm making today are for my kids and for your kids and it's so great to to, to be here and to thank Joe and Julie for the foundation that you've given me and my family and um, you know I look forward to reaching out Joe in the future here and um, I'm just you know feel grace to have be walking in the shoes of the group that's here you know I mean it's fascinating and, and, and it's life changing and it's worth it to look in your seven year old boy's eyes and say I'm doing the right thing you'll understand one day you know and thank you go Linda <laughs> so I'm not the kind of person that stands up in front of groups and says stuff. I always rely on my friend Nancy Macy and my friend Julie over here. <laughs> but I have to say, <laughs> I have to say that Julie, gorgeous, beautiful, incredible, funny, adorable Julie, and that's it. Sorry, <laughs> I'm ready to cry. Okay, so um, I started the Redwood Mountain Fair, which is like this tiny little organization that raised over $500,000 for all of the nonprofits in the valley. And is going on now. It's like uh, rejuvenated and restructured, and it's great. It's wonderful. But we had something that was really amazing in the beginning years. It was called a juried art exhibit, and it was in the main house of the um, Highlands Park in the mansion and Julie helped to put the whole thing together she helped to jury it to get it to be something that was like I mean we have artists in the valley that are phenomenal look around you I mean they're phenomenal artists they don't exhibit you know in a lot of other places and Julie helped to give them 
an incredible venue, um, an opportunity to receive the recognition that they really deserved, and prize money, which of course artists don't need at all, <laughs> right? And Julie put it together, she juried it, she did it. It was like she was the main influence of the arts in this community for so many years before this was ever even created. And besides being an amazing influence, she was the heart of the arts in this community. And I'll love her forever. Something. We want to do something. Oh, yeah. So we want to do something this year at the fair. We're going to find some way of giving Julie the recognition and the ability to continue that art on. So anyway. That's I'm it. sure Joe will give us some ideas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Joe is the way that I actually met Julie. So working for Joe. Hooray for Joe. Yeah. So. Well, I didn't get a chance to, uh, to get to know Julia as well as I would like. Um, that's, I'm sure that we all feel that way. Um, and uh, um, Julia is one of those people that makes you feel like a, like a god, basically. And um, I'm not sure it's so deserved, but um, I, I know where it comes from. And uh, Julia has certainly uh, given so much to so many of us that make us all feel more than we ever would be without her. And uh, we're lucky we still have that. So thank Julie. I'm surprised nobody else mentioned this, but when Joe was running for supervisor, the Reverend Glenn Cullen oh, in Scotts Valley just thought it was awful that they were living in sin. <laughs> and <laughs> Joe, <laughs> you're still <sin. laughs> And Joe said he hoped people would tell funny stories about Julie. Well, I remember on Halloween that year, Julie wearing a little black cocktail dress, which only Julie could wear because she was slim, and she painted the hell of a scarlet A on her chest. <laughs> and I just thought, that's courage. So she had courage, she had conviction, and she had something special. So. And she had Joe. It's really helpful when you're running for office to have somebody wear a scarlet. <laughs> 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 Joyce, how about you? I have a very small statement. That's, small statements are okay. I'll hold the cup for you since you come. Okay, thank you. Well, Julie and I, I met her through this lady here and uh, showed her real estate. And we were often politically not aligned. Julie knew that it was a measure of your intellect to be able to disagree and not be disagreeable. And so we did. And I always felt we were friends, as with Joe. We could disagree and never be disagreeable. And I think that's a gift that, that she had. Patty, are you there? I am. Are you hiding? No, I'm here. I'm standing. <laughs> You're tagging this okay, thing. I don't want to take it. How about um, just the mic? I'll keep no, the mug for you. No, I don't want the mic either. I'm loud. Okay, this is I'll point it at you. <laughs> okay, so I've been standing here, and I, I haven't known, I, I haven't known Julie nearly. I'm going to lose it. I haven't known Julie nearly as long as most of you. Julie and I are what were what I would call everyday friends. We were in touch every day. We talked about everything, everything you could possibly think of. I was going for my master's in philosophy. She was trying to take care of her mom, who was getting ready to go into the old actor's home. I did theater for 20 years, and I would hear stories about her mom, her kids, her grandkids. I heard everything. Our favorite thing to do was, I'd call her, walk in a day. She says, I'm walking today. We would walk to Boulder Creek. We would get ice cream. We would get coffee. We would get cherry strudel at Jenna Sue's. We would, that's the kind of stuff we did. I would go to her house, and I would go, wow. 
Because every time I walked through that door, I saw a new piece. I saw something I'd never seen before, and her art was everywhere. <laughs> I wasn't going to talk to her. <laughs> her art was in her cooking. Her art was in her cleaning. Oh my God, there were floors I could eat off of, right? And I would always go to her house and go, wow, and her yard was manicured and so perfect. She would come to my house and Everything was wild. She walked into my yard and everything grew hugely. Lots of blackberry bushes and all kinds of stuff. My house was never like hers. <laughs> but it was like amazing. We'd go to her house and we would have, you know, roasted red peppers and curry and all these things. And we would, I would get there early and we would cook together because she would teach me stuff. And of course, she always knew everything because she insisted to me that she got to tell me what to do because she was, after all, older. A whole two years, right? Anyway, so... She would come to my house and I turned her on to, believe it or not, old movies. Humphrey Bogart, Clark Gable, Claudette Colbert, Gary Cooper. She didn't know any of them. And I had Notorious and I had, I had everything. I had Maltese Falcon. We would do dinner and a movie night and we would have tostadas and, and beer floats or we would, have, we would have Cosmos or we would have margaritas. And then she kept insisting that Mythical Joe, which is what I called Joe because he was back east and I kept insisting that he was mythical. Because I hadn't met him, I'd only heard his voice on the phone. She said, when he gets home, you guys are going to do a bartender competition because I swear, yours are just as good as his, but don't tell him I said that. <laughs> because Joe and I both like to bartend, right? So anyway, her whole thing was, I mean, her art was everywhere, which was great. And, and her grandkids, right? She was home to her grandkids, and she calls me, and she says, okay, my grandson, Cypher, is going to come and spend a few days with me, and you're the fun aunt, right? Because all my nieces and nephews like to come to my house and play. She says, you got it. What do you got? What do you got that I can play with cipher with? Well, I have all these like things like pickup sticks and tiddly wings. He's a little too old for board games. I mean, a little too young for board games and stuff like that. So she's like taking all these games. <laughs> and the one thing was the final thing, and this this I guess this is my funny part. I had a room at housemate at the time, also named Patty. And so I'm over at Julie's and we're talking about games she can play with the kids. Do you remember how to play jazz? Of course I do. I still have some. Okay, well, bring those over. So me and Julie are sitting on our floor drinking wine, playing jacks. <laughs> at 1 o'clock in the morning, we get a call from Patty saying, where are you? And I said, I'm over at Julie's playing jacks and drinking wine. Come over. And so the three of us are sitting on the floor <laughs> drinking wine, playing jacks, trying to get better at the game so that Julie can teach her grandkids. <laughs> so that's my thing with Julie was like that, like bringing your grandkids over to my house because they fed animals there, right? Cypher flew, feeding all these blue jays and having them land right in front of him and getting so excited that you see the rapture in his face and watching Julie watch that was just, she, like everybody has said here, she saw so much in everything and everything was art, you know, but, but she, but she embraced stuff she was un, that was unfamiliar to her too. I mean, it was like, she would look at me and say, I don't know why we're such good friends. We're really different. And I would say, I don't care. And she says, neither do I. And then we have another Cosmo or whatever. <laughs> so, that's it, you know, playing jacks. It's a little story about a young man who's here, my son, my oldest son. <laughs> I have four sons. That didn't leave us a lot of money to do a lot of things, so we were always looking for something to do. And it turned out that Julie and Joe, and Joe's great ingenuity, it was always art behind the scenes. <laughs> he had cooked up this scheme for a bedroom in the basement. But the bedroom in the basement meant that they had to move about five yards of gravel and rocks and cement out from underneath there. And, so this would be a way to, to occupy Gaben the whole summer so that he could afford to go on a trip. So he spent the summer digging out their basement. Now, this is stuff people don't know. But you know what? They knew how to use their resources. And also, I think it was a blessing. It was really a blessing because it was very an ingenious way to help my son accomplished something in his life which has inspired him all his life. And he speaks about it sometimes. And he never really brings up the back-breaking work, but the joy that it got in his life. And I think that's part of what was going on. We, we've heard a lot about the surface fun stuff. But behind all that was a lot of work and a lot of practical experience 
that was given to all of us. And she could always make my work seem more practical. And I just, I just had to add that, because I know Gibbons right now running the video, but he's, that, that was her godson. Now, I'm not so sure what that meant, <laughs> but it meant they had a special connection. And I'll tell you what, she was everybody's godmother, mine too. <laughs> So. <laughs> I don't know all the story behind that. And, and poor Gaben just had back surgery. Yeah. <laughs> Show you what to do. Okay. Wow. Again, I don't know what to say either. Um, I met Julie very late in life. It was at this wonderful Rebecca's and Hank's famous, famous art gallery openings. And it was my very first ceramic artist that I'd met. And thereafter, I met Linda Levy, of course, in the Art Center. But it was my very first person that I had met in ceramics. And I was so overwhelmed by the statues and the amazing, glorious. I mean, it was just, Julie was just bigger than life anyway. And the, then again, the, the, the repartee and the wit and the funny and the, the Julie was, was there every time. And Rebecca and Hank had these art gallery openings every once a month. It was fabulous. And I, lo I just lusted to, to see Julie again and, and, and to meet this young man who helped us also with our property. We had just moved here. So I was really thank you, Joe, for what you did for us. But over the time and the years that I've seen her, and last year, we, had, we begged her to come to Saramarama and let us love you. You know, for God's sakes, girl, come here. And she came, and it was, it was really magical. I will always remember that. I'm so grateful for that. And I want to say, too, Joe, that what you did for Julie, I know that she did so much, but I also want to say you were there so much for her, and I'm, I'm just so grateful for what you've done as well. Yeah, um, well, on behalf of the Art Center, um, Julie was such an inspiration to us in so many different ways. I can't tell you the number of people that she touched in um, with her humor, with her outlook on life, with her very incredible sense of aesthetics, um, the values that she carried with her all the time um, definitely touched us all. And um, I, I was laughing because, you know, we were talking about, about remembering things. And um, in helping um, put all this together, I went through all the photographs that we've collected over the years for the, a lot of shows that we've done. And um, it, was, it was really an incredible trip to go back and look at all the different work. I was looking for Julie's work, and we had a lot of her work in the gallery over the years. And, um, and uh, it was my pleasure to get to know Julie on a number of different levels. But she was always there to help and inspire and to have fun with. And that was really a bottom line, was having fun. Um, we have an annual event that we do. This is, I think, our 11th or 12th Ceramorama coming up. And on the very first Ceramorama, um, Julie and Dan Hennig got together and made the trophies, and they were hysterical. And I think Dan and, and Julie must have had an incredible time together making these trophies, and it really showed. Um, this year, we're dedicating our Ceramorama in Julie's memory. Um, and uh, we were inspired by her sense of humor with the trophies that were made for this year. So um, there's a bit of wit and humor in them all. And um, I think that's what we carry. And uh, I, I remember you know, re getting to know Julie a little bit better. Uh, she and Joe showed up at my uh, open studio. And we hit, it, we hit it off, got into deeper conversation, and they never left. <laughs> <laughs> We asked to be invited to dinner. Yeah, yeah, they asked to be invited to dinner. And we had, we had a great time. And, um, but also, I work with Julie um, in so many different ways. And one of the things that I remember really enjoying was we got together and designed posters for the different shows that we were doing here. And it was always um, a creative, inspirational 
um, activity to go through and, and you know you talk about everything while you're working on these things and um, I just I carry that with me all the time I think it's she's a, a, a person that was always upbeat and positive about things um, and made you um, appreciate things on so many different levels and um, that's something to really be treasured I think so and I, I thank you all for coming here tonight. Um, and I thank Joe for wanting to do this. The Art Center is definitely, we're very honored to be able to host this tonight. So. Thank you so much. Dan, how about you? You said some wonderful things to me the other night. I, you've got real things to say about Julie. You know her at the core. Well, I don't quite know what to say, but uh, I, I, we, I'll, I'll just reiterate what Linda just said, that we did make those great trophies for the, for the very first Ceramorama, and I just remember that I had thrown all these different parts and pieces, and she just, and Julie came over and said, well, let's put this together, and let's put this on here, and I'm, I'm going, oh, well, that's not what I thought, but yeah, that's fine, that's good, let's do that, you know? <laughs> So we just kept adding on all these parts and pieces, and uh, and then she said, you know, Dan, you should you should do this more. I don't know if you really like the work that you're doing right now. You know, <laughs> you know, you should do this more. You know, so she she was definitely an inspiration. She just kind of kept pushing us to just try something new out. You know, so that was it was really fun. She turned me on to a whole new palette. Look at I mean all these colors that I had never used before. Uh, and since then, we've, I've been using them in my studio, you know, it's just, uh, yeah, I'll, we'll all miss her. <laughs> Who's got something else to say? How about you, Harry? <laughs> you, you've had some moments with Julie. <laughs> well, you know, I've been thinking about this a lot. And, um... I think for me and listen to everybody that, that Julie, I mean, I just can't believe I'm still standing and she's not, you know, it's like she was, she's, was always like another dimension to me. She'd come in and, you know, and there'd be, she'd say something like out of left field to me, you know, like, and I'd see everything, oh, yeah, you know, she, she had that way of like looking at things and they, they were just different than other people, you know, I mean, it's not like, it, it, it was like, it's just kind of keeping you straight, you know, <laughs> just kind of saying, that's a way of looking at something. I don't have to look at, you know, I don't, I don't need to see the world the way I'm seeing it now. I can appreciate it the way that she just saw it. And that's kind of what I can't believe is gone. That dimension. It's just like another dimension. I came in as a friend of a friend, and I was welcomed. She allowed me to be her book friend. She allowed me to be her friend. She loved you, Joe. You let us have a date. <laughs> you shared her with me. <laughs> and she, she always wanted to win this fight. Um, I lost my mom to the same kind of fight, but my mom chose not to go there. But Julie said, I'm fighting. I'm going there. And uh, I don't think she's left us. No. I don't think she's <laughs> yes. left us. And she keeps waking things up in us. Waking things up. Yes. <sighs> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> you have it. <laughs> oh, Jim. Your husband good. Oh, 
So I just love all the things that I've been hearing from all of you. I have to say ditto on everything. Um, I haven't, I didn't get to know Julie as well as I wanted to, but every time I was around her and in her presence, she was always very inspiring, uplifting, and like so many of you said, found the good and the direction and everything, and it was a reminder of being present here and now. It doesn't matter past, future, it's all just right now. And um, I just really love the way she encourages and has hope for everybody that she came across. And it's very inspirational to me, and I see that it's done the same for all of you, and it's awesome. My name is Peter. Um, I'm a neighbor of Joe and Julie's in Brookdale. Um, and <clears throat> some of my recollections um, has been in the garden. I've been working in the garden and in the afternoons and then I'll hear a little rustle over the side of the fence and I'll look over and I'll see Julie also um, tending to her garden as well. So. Um, so those images, you know, are, are strong with me. Um, also, I, I, I see how Julie could, um, like, it's like this, she appreciates the, the beauty of life. And I remember um, take her, her bringing, I guess, her grandchildren over to the fence. Um, we've got a chicken coop. Um, and just asking her grandchildren to watch the chickens. And she was as much into watching the the movement of the chickens as her grandchildren and it was just the inner child in her I think that that was there just observing and uh, I know that over the years if um, if she had a, a request for anything that she wouldn't hesitate to to ask um, she was always so much of a guardian in the neighborhood of um, making sure that um, you know, she knew that she was, that I knew that she was aware of, uh, you know, who was coming in and out and that, you know, we should be on alert and just being aware, so important. So, just wanted to say hey to Julie and thank you. No, I'm not jumping up, I'm just helping out. Okay, this is a little story about Julie and the two of you. Once, once upon a time, I had Joe and Julie and you over for a brunch on my, at my house. And you guys were about the ages of, what's your? Rio. He, as he three and is. Five. Yes, three and five. You were <laughs> starting to climb a very, very tender little sapling tree in the backyard. I'm sitting here, Julie's here, you're running around. I'm not, you were there too, but you aren't climbing the tree. I'm freaked out because you're climbing this tree and it's going like this and you're climbing and I'm going, no. Julie turns around and just says to you, Josh, just take a look at the tree, study it, and be mindful. And, and that's all she said. I'm sitting there thinking you're going to like slingshot into the space or something. So it was a tender story that I retold to her not too long ago. So it was, it was a fun story. I'm passing it back to you. Did we miss anyone, Joe? Well, there's a few people. How about Alicia? time to see me. She actually looked, she actually took the time to see me and I heard that from so many people that she looks deeply, that she appreciates the heart of the person there and um, I love her for doing that for me. Sometimes you really need to be seen and she caught me at a good time and I'm grateful. Is anyone else? Well, I'm going to complete what my mother was saying. Uh, you know, I, 
Well, I worked hard there at, at, at your house, and we like were... Like a dog. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. I think I actually grew a tail, maybe. And, <laughs> and it, but it was, it was extremely satisfying, not, not just like the hard work aspect, which, which I have always appreciated, but any time we weren't digging in that earth and pulling rocks out of the soil, there was Joe and Julie and, and of course, Josh and Damien, and, and being around the family that close. Because I mean, I'd, known, I'd known the family for a long time. We'd had many visits. But that was a kind of a time when I got to be saturated in, in, <laughs> you know, in, the, in the experience there. And it's truly the art, the art that um, came from Julie. I can see it how it inspired me in my life. And then, in fact, the work that she gave, that you guys gave us, sent me off to Europe, where I spent six, eight months, and it changed my life forever. And I still feel like that inspiration, combined with the art that I that I experienced there, still, it's still, it's still part of me, it's, and it'll always be a part of me, and I'll always appreciate that. Um, then I think we had some really good paintball wars. <laughs> 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 well, no, nobody did. <laughs> no QT at the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I will, um, I will always miss her. And, um, but I'll always have her as well. Uh, I can be blessed for that. Very much so. Yeah. Can we sing happy birthday to June? Oh, sure. Happy birthday. Oh, yeah. Oh, can we do it? Oh, there you go. Yeah. Oh, we have to do it. <laughs> yeah, I, I forgot to say something I wanted to mention when I was standing up, which was um, people were speaking to Julie's ability to notice and study and, you know, give you advice to study. And um, we had a client that had children that wanted pets so bad, and every day I'd be working there, and then the people, the kids would come up, these little children, like, can we get a kitty, or can we get a dog? And the parents were like, no, we can't, you know, this everything's white kind of house, and no, we can't have an animal. And I felt so bad for these kids that they couldn't have any animals that I finally thought, well, maybe we can, you know, have ceramic animals or something that they could connect with these animals because they wanted animals so bad. So I thought of this idea of doing a cat garden with the cats in places that the kids could get to the cats. And I proposed this idea to Julie, who embraced it thoroughly. And we had a meeting to set up to talk about the study of what kind of cats and you know what they would be like. And, and I just remember being completely blown away because that long table that she worked on, she had like a dozen books on cats in every shape and size. And she started talking about it in detail about the way they would curl their paw in and their rump would do just this and the tail would go up there and their hip would come out. And I mean, things I kind of noticed about cats, but I mean, she noticed everything about cats and about every kind of cat. And I was just amazed. I was astounded that she had put all this study and time and effort and got into the core and essence of cats to do this project. And um, when I came in, I noticed this is one of the cats and um, kind of an angel cat. But uh, it really affected the kids' lives. And I, I actually got one of the cats, which we had a party that ended up early before I got home. And I was calling my husband, get the cat out before the kids throw a football. But they threw a football and broke the cat. But anyway, I loved it for many years. So I just wanted to say how much. Um, she really entered her art and her work and how much it came through for people to enjoy. You nailed it. Yeah. Did we miss anyone, Joe? He's I tried a few. You did, but you, you did <laughs> good. Resistant. The only reason I'm asking is because when I start speaking, oh, no. then we might all have to like start going home, which is really sad. So this is this is kind of your last chance. Does anyone want to get in on this? Did you speak, Sheila? She. Yes, Sheila. Sheila. She did. She, she did twice, actually. I think I think twice. You'll, it'll be on TV. 
I, I, I actually think we've been doing a really good job. Uh, there has been so much more laughter and applause than crying that Julie would feel at peace here. She, she, this is what she would want. Personally, this is what I would want. You know, I can't speak for the rest of you, but tears and, oh, she was a great woman. You know, that's not Julie. We've been telling good stories, and uh, that's nice. We did do one thing wrong. This probably should have been filled with champagne the entire time. And then you wouldn't have had a problem getting people to actually take the cup. You know, we just, the problem would have been keeping it filled. But um, I, I've spent the past week and a half or so with images of Julie. And this theme has come up over and over again. But she was an incredibly beautiful woman. And as a son, that's not something that clicks with you usually. It's just years later you go like, oh, wow, this is incredible. And a lot of people, that's enough for them. Their, their life, I'm a beautiful person and I'm a success. Julie didn't stop there. She didn't stop with just being a beautiful woman, a beautiful person. She went on and she made beautiful things and she made the world around her more beautiful. And that wasn't enough for Julie either. She went on and she made your life more beautiful, your life more beautiful, and I'm not gonna point to all of you, but she has made each of our lives more beautiful in different ways. And this is beginning to sound a lot like a eulogy, and if Julie was sitting over there, she would roll her eyes, say something snarky <laughs> that was like nice on the surface, but then you think about it a little bit and you're like, ouch, <laughs> Julie, did you really just say that to me? So I'm not going to go any further with that train of thought. I, I really like the stories and the memories of this. I, I've spent the past couple of weeks just trying to think of memories and stories. And, once again, it's, it's something that escapes you when you're that person's child. It's just, uh, I don't want to say background noise, but it, it's different when you're removed. But I've been thinking long and hard about it. One of the things that has really come to me is, is parenting. And that's something you don't truly appreciate until you become a parent yourself. You know, when you're just a child, it's like, yeah, that's their job. They do it. I'm okay. <laughs> then you have your own children. You're like, whoa. <laughs> How did that happen? That's incredible what you put up with. Yeah. And Julie wasn't a single parent, but she was the primary parent. I mean, you know, there's my dad who was far away, and Joe was always there, but Joe was extremely respectful about the fact that these were Julie's children, and he was always 100% behind her, but he knew this was, she was mom. And he was there for her, but, you know, she, she did it. And the things that I think made me who I am, well, she, she taught us how to cook. And I don't know how she taught us how to cook, because it wasn't, it was just by including us in the cooking. I remember making granola. We made our own bloody granola with this big thing that we would turn and then we would bake it and you know that was at, it, it got to the point where I was I read Little House on the Prairie and there's recipes in there and I was like I'm gonna go cook this hardtack or I, I, don't, I just started making things and I don't know how I went from being a little kid to helping Julie to just cooking things out of books but I did. Kiki I'm really Glad you're here because somehow every night we ate dinner together. Pretty much every night. Every night. Every night. And somehow Joshua and I would clear the table, wash the dishes, drain the dishes, sweep the entire bloody oh, kitchen floor. Oh, nice. And I, I don't remember you guys like, if you don't do this, it's a timeout or you're going to lose your no. video game privileges. I don't know how you guys got us to do it, but we did it every single night. So, Kiki, take note. <laughs> it's coming. Oh, I scared him away. Yeah.
Um, I, I, I've heard a bunch of mentions of Redwood Community School and University of Trees, and I, I don't know how Julie and probably Joe decided on that, but I'm grateful. I think it really helped broaden my brain in ways that I will never really understand, but they thought outside the box when I was really small, and I'm, you know, I did yoga instead of PE. We, we, we meditated and le learned to tune our chakras, which, you know, I haven't <laughs> needed that skill, but if I do, I, I'm, I'm ready. They, I don't know how you guys did this, they would take us to shows and nightlife and live music on school nights all over the valley. The, what is it, Kumba Jazz Center? I mean, most of the time I was in the corner reading a book because it's like, yeah, whatever, <laughs> this is interesting guys, but can we go home? But like, I, I still, I don't know how old I was, I remember this guy that could circular breathe while he played the saxophone. And that got me, I'm just like, whoa, this guy doesn't stop. He, it keeps going and going and going, and this is actually kind of interesting. And they drug us out to the Raku Festival the entire weekend. And I would like see Julian Friday when we got there. I don't think I'd see you guys again until Sunday afternoon. Other people would feed us. We would do stuff. <laughs> it was just this place with large pits of fire and lots of people on drugs, and it was fun. <laughs> I, I, that really comes down to, and I think you know, you kind of brought it up that the space and the freedom that Julie and Joe gave us to just mature and develop and grow. And I'm pretty sure they were watching more closely than I believe they were. I, you know. <laughs> but you know, we had a horn. Yeah. <coughs> you know, on on Saturday morning Josh and I would go out into the Santa Cruz Mountains and we wouldn't come back until well until we heard the horn. Which usually was blown, you know, around when it's starting to get dark. But we could be miles away. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know, I, I'm not brave enough to parent the way they do. I'm trying, I'm, I try and give my kids some space, but I think it also made me who I am. And it is important to give people the space to grow, and it's a hard thing to do. I remember long car rides in a little... 1970 BMW, we went everywhere in that car. I remember Halloween costumes. Julie would make our Halloween costumes for us. And then when we got older, we would make our own. But the only reason I could make my own costume is because Julie had helped us make them. We never thought about buying a Halloween costume. Um, clay has been mentioned a lot. And I played with some clay with Julie, but you know, it was intimidating. I didn't go there with her. I did my own thing. It's, that was her space. And, um, I, I, I couldn't quite do it. And I think just summing up Julie's parenting is this quiet encouragement. She just had a way of pushing you along without actively pushing you along. You almost didn't know, but she had a sense and a way of helping you along. So, you know, this is, this is the point where you kind of say, you know, what, what is a life successfully lived? And for me, it's, it's things like leaving the world that you lived in a better and more beautiful place. It's walking softly on the earth and not taking more than you need. And if you're somebody who has children, teaching them to think for themselves, make their own decisions, and you know, hopefully do the same, but not enforcing that on them. So, 
I miss you, Julie. I love you. And you'll be with me, my children, my family, and the community around me for ever, because we will pass her on in little ways. I remember Julie, we go, it was like the early 70s. It's like 1970, wasn't it? Like May? You I was zero. born. Yeah. That's when we first met. It's not as old as, as long as a lot of people have known her, but it was, it was a memorable time. It stuck with me. Um, yeah, yeah. She's like, hey! And I screamed too. I cried. I cried a lot. Um, Julie is, you know, an insane artist, and a lot of her recognition is as a ceramicist, a fine artist. And I tried this evening. With, with a few of her uh, ceramic faces to paint on my face some of her stuff with, with Carolyn's help. And, you know, I've never tried that before, you know. We, we took art classes, we took charcoal drawing classes, cartooning classes, painting classes, ceramic classes, you know. They certainly influenced us, you know, in that, on that regard. I think it didn't stick in the same way as it does, you know. <laughs> with some folks. <laughs> but I was tonight trying to draw on my face, which I can't see, but you can, you know, some of Julie's art. And I, it's amazing. It's like so the simple geometric stuff that she does. And I, and I was just realizing, oh, you just do it like this. And I was like, but it's, you know, she has this, this style, you know, and her style changed, you know. We have this art, you know. We, we've seen, we're kind of coming together with all this different art of Julie's over many years, and her style changed over those 30, 40 years. And it's really beautiful. And, you know, I, I love that about her, but in all reality, that's not how I spent most of my time with Julie. Most of my time with Julie was spent in the kitchen. Most of it. Those are my memories, is, you know, baking bread. Julie would, would take a, a tomato, these big tomato juice cans, these really big ones, and make bread in them. And the bread would rise up and mushroom out the top, and we'd take to school round bread, you know, round bread. That was our sandwiches. Um, we would just spend, you know, we, we would be able to make our own cakes and put food coloring in them and they could be green or they could be whatever. I mean, that's where we spent our time was hanging out in the kitchen, Joe's Italian food culture and Julie's blended together beautifully. I think more of our food culture is Italian, but at the same time, Julie was an amazing, amazing creative cook. We started out vegetarian and then we incorporated meat along the way and now with my son somewhere over there the little guy you see around that's where we spend our time you know we were making the cakes that you hopefully eat in a little bit and he's breaking eggs and he's just like that's where he's comfortable and and my wife and I work really hard and we're away all the time but we're in the kitchen you know when we're home we're in the kitchen and that's really really important and that's Julie, you know, and Joe brought that to us, which was making pasta from scratch. It was, you know, that, that was our time. It wasn't actually in the studio making ceramics all the time. It was cooking. <laughs> in all reality, that's where you spend a lot of your time. Um, after the kitchen, it was in the garden. Julie is, for those who don't know, is an amazing gardener and a horticulturalist. And you know, when, in, in the, the mid-70s at Highlands Park, we had a, you know, there was community gardens there. And we had a community garden plot that was, you know, as big as this building's footprint. And we grew all of our vegetables there. And it was, 
just what we did as kids. We just grew vegetables. And then back in Brookdale, we grew vegetables. And then Julie moved more on into to, to landscaping and, and horticulture and using natives and ornamentals in her very huge yard. And that's, you know, that was our labor, was pushing the wheelbarrow, was <laughs> cutting English ivy, endlessly cutting English <laughs> ivy. You know, it was, you know, it was living under the redwoods in Brookdale. And <laughs> That had a huge impact on me. And you know, I went on to different careers. I did graphic design for a while, but now you know, what I do is plant ecology. I went on, I did a master's in ecology, and I'm a restoration ecologist. And that's because Julie taught me this love of plants and figuring out how they fit and, and, and the design and the art and the beauty of plants and figuring how to arrange and bring them together. And that is the, the career that I've chosen after several others. But it's Julie's sense of who she is and her sense of art that has, has, is not just in the clay. And, and, and the last thing is, is Julie's whimsy. Julie has an amazing silliness that I think, I don't know. I know very well, I'm sure you know. I don't know if everybody knows, but she's, she's kind of, she's a, she's a joker. She's a jokester. And I, I'm remembering like, our, our father passed away in June, a month before our mother, which is shitty. Um, <laughs> But we had a memorial a month or so ago for our father, and it reminded me all these things that you kind of like go, that person is gone, and now I have these questions. You know, when did I first walk? You know, these, these silly little stuff. What were the first words I uttered? And so after our father passed away, and Julie and Joe were spending a lot of time in hospitals, and I went you know, to Julie's bedside, and I'm like, you know, the first words I said, you know, and Julie's just like, go away, you know what I mean? It's just like, she's not thinking about this stuff day to day. I mean, Julie is, is Julie. She's there and she's present. And, you know, within, you know, a blink of an eye, we were talking about my wife and I maybe buying land in Michigan and whether that was a good idea and how we could finance the land and, you know, just you know, I call it free advice. It was just talking about life and about, you know, the fog out the window and how damn foggy it is in San Francisco. You know, it's... She's here and now. She's here and now, and, and, and I'm very much that way. I, I'm just, here I am. I'm here right now. I don't know where I'll be tomorrow. And, and Julie is, Julie hasn't left me at all. I, I, I'm sure I've not done the, the, the appropriate level of grieving, but, you know, Julie is present, and like many times when I've traveled and been far away from her, she's with me, and I, and I think about her, and I talk to her, and when I dance with her tonight, you know, she's there with me. And so thank you all for, for being here with Julie and, and keeping her alive. And thank you for supporting Joe. Um, so in my family, for your birthday, we have one particular cake. And this cake, once again, actually comes from Joe's side of the family. It, it was, it's an Italian peasant cake. And uh, Joe's great-grandmother baked it, and then his grandmother, and his mother taught it to Julie, who perfected it. It became her favorite cake. What, what village was that, Joe? Luca Varga. Luca Barraga. It's where it comes from, and it's, it was our birthday cake. Yeah. So I think it's only appropriate on Julie's birthday to make a Colombo cake for her and sing happy birthday for her. Because today is her birthday. Right. Yep. Yeah. 69 years young. Come on in, Rio. Pase, Rio. Pase adelante. Okay. okay. Ready? Ready? Happy birthday to you, 
Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Julie. Happy birthday to you. And you know, we didn't discuss this, but I, who is more appropriate to blow out the candles than? Do you guys want to blow them out? Yeah. Ready? Three. One, two, and everyone else can blow too. Three. <laughs> And I, I'm sorry, you've heard a lot about them, but I have not introduced Rio Tallis, Kieran Taylor, Kiki, and Cypher Taylor. Uh, these are the grandchildren. You were 